I am incredibly excited about our conversation today. Um, but before I continue, a brief background on myself so that you get to know me a little bit better. My name is Kunleya Pampa. I head Client Solutions at Capricorn Investment Group, which is a purpose-built outsource chief investment officer, as well as an innovative fund manager. We've had the great fortune of managing the capital for Jeff Skoll and the Skoll Foundation for 23 years. Why is that very applicable to the conversation today? One of the th hardest things that we had to do throughout that journey was distill very subjective mission and impact objectives into prudent investment management objectives. And that's very hard to do. But it gave me an opportunity to work with the programmatic side, the philanthropic side, especially the Skoll Foundation, finding innovative ways to be able to catalyze a lot of those thematic areas into investment opportunities. But today, we're gonna to focus particularly on the philanthropic capital. And I think the title of this session already explains itself. So I wanna do less talking and give more of the <clears> opportunity <throat> for the panelists to really share examples. Today's session is less about what is it, or more so, let's peel back that curtain and get some real tangible, real life lived experiences on how to really think about de-risking investments using philanthropic capital as a tool. I'm very sure each and every one of you here today have different tools in the toolbox that you can leverage. This is one of them. And so our objective is very simple today. Our three phenomenal individuals on the stage today will share how they have leveraged philanthropic capital to do exactly what I described. I've challenged them to illustrate their responses um, through good storytelling, data, experiences, and any support that they can give as well. So that's why particularly today, I'm excited about it. Because I get to hear stories that I probably have never heard them talk about before, or they hid from me when we had a, a little backstage conversation as well. So very exciting. I will just give a brief introduction, but also allow them to sort of share their own backgrounds as well. On stage with me is Liesl Pritzker Simmons with Blue Haven Initiative. Quick wave. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Daniel Ubre of Fondation Corona and Belinda Morris of Colibri Catalyst. So without further ado, I want to invite our panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Belinda. Thanks, Kunle. And thanks very much to the Sorensen Impact Institute and SOCAP sponsors for um, hosting, co-hosting the um, SOCAP 23. It's great to see everybody back, and I feel like we're finally back um, in action after COVID. Last year, it was a little bit stilted. Um, and thanks for prioritizing this track on philanthropy and catalytic capital. I think although Philanthropy's pockets aren't as deep as government pockets. They certainly play an outsized role in mobilizing capital for impact. And so it's really exciting to see hear all these conversations going on at SOCAP today. So I'm Belinda Morris. I'm the co-founder and managing director of Calibri Catalyst. In my previous life, I had a role working with philanthropy, and it was the catalytic potential of philanthropic capital that um, pro that launch, inspired me, I guess would be the word, to launch um, a catalytic capital facility. So I worked on program-related investments and grant making in the climate and land use space at, at the Packard Foundation. And we saw an increasing need for a coordinated approach to building markets as markets for nature-based solutions. And you know, 10 years ago, we would have thought investing in nature-based solutions was high in the sky, and now we're seeing it actually in action, and I'm really thrilled to see a lot of panels here at SOCAP focused on it as well. Um, so I founded Calibri Catalyst, Catalyst to address this challenge. So Calibri is a catalytic capital facility that aims to improve the flow and performance of private capital, private investment in sustainable land use and nature-based solutions. Um, the, the goal of the facility is to aggregate and deploy um, catalytic capital to, to intermediary vehicles and scalable enterprises that are investing in nature-based solutions in emerging markets. We believe that strong intermediary, intermediary vehicles and, and scalable enterprises play a really important role 
in getting private capital to nature-based solutions on the ground. And, and that is why um, we want to build this nascent sector. There's a lot of perceived and real risk that we need to address, and philanthropic capital is, is primed to do so. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Daniel? Hi, thank you, Tony. It's an honor to be here. I'm Daniel Uribe. I'm the executive director of Fundacion Corona. I'm from Bogota, Colombia. Fundacion Corona is a family foundation that has been working over the last six decades on promoter social development, equity, and actually social change within the country that has a lot of challenges in inequality. Uh, the, the best way we have been doing it over the last six decades is trying to help build knowledge, tools, and advocacy in a system that has to be building like a systemic approach in a much more holistic way. And from the foundation, we're trying to promote social mobility. And, and to do that, we're mainly focused on education to employment and citizenship engagement. And on those topics of economic development or, or education to employment, we have seen that there is a huge challenge on the scale, as you were mentioning. And for that reason, we have been working, I think, over the last six years trying to understand which vehicles, methodologies can philanthropy try to promote, to develop, and to co-create at the philanthropic se sector, but also at the public sector, including the private sector. So on my background myself, I have been working the last 20 years also trying to connect the private sector with the social sector within the country. I have worked at Endeavor, at Investment Banking, and last also at the foundation over the last 10 years. And, and it's an honor to, to be able to share what Colombia and also the Latin region is trying to work. Thank you. Liesl? <coughs> um, so hi, everyone. Uh, Liesl Pritzker-Simmons. I'm uh, the co-founder and principal of Blue Haven Initiative. Uh, we're a single family office um, that's focused sort of 100% of our uh, investment assets on, on impact investing. Um, and over the sort of 13 years that we've, we've done this, um, we, we take a, a, a multi-asset class kind of multi-sector approach. Um, we, we have a, a large investment portfolio that's in lots of different asset classes and lots of different impact sectors, um, but really trying to just really pay attention to what every investment in the portfolio is doing um, from a financial standpoint as well as social and environmental. Um, and uh, what's been interesting is over the years, seeing how our philanthropy um, and, and catalytic capital has actually been responsive to gaps and things that we see in our investment portfolio. And really what we've kind of seen is that markets are really great and wonderful at scaling very specific things. And then there are lots of things markets are very bad at. Um, and, and maybe that's where government policy advocacy uh, comes into play as opposed to trying to use our investment portfolio to solve every problem that we see. Um, but as a family office, we've got lots of those different tools. And so, um, you know, really over the years, what we found is uh, sort of play, taking away investments from places where investments shouldn't play, um, putting philanthropy there, um, and then really leaning into areas and sectors and solutions and companies and fund strategies where, you know, market rate or near market rate capital is actually pretty good. Um, and so that's kind of how we view things at Blue Haven and try to look holistically um, and, you know, apply the right tool for, for what we're seeing. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So we're going to get into the core of today's conversation. And many of you have already gotten a little bit of a, a preview. Pulse check, how are we doing? Doing good? All right. I like the thumbs up. Thank you. I appreciate it. So Lisa, over the years, we've had an opportunity to work together. Um, and I really like Blue Haven's approach to the whole portfolio and how you view multiple different tools in that toolbox to be able to solve issues. And you kind of touched on that. So let's dig into, describe the role of catalytic capital to you and your organization. And if you could share with the group some really good lived experiences or real life example of how you think about the market rate side of the house informing the philanthropic and vice versa. So one, one example I'll give, um, so starting about nine years ago, we took a, a portion of our private equity portfolio and decided we wanted to focus on um, 
uh, fintech businesses in sub-Saharan Africa. I had a microfinance background in the past. I have always believed the most interesting financial services models are coming out of countries where you've got, you know, a, a young, underbanked, digitally savvy population um, and uh, mobile, high money, mobile money penetration. Like there's just so many interesting fintech solutions that are coming out of those markets. And so we decided to build a, a venture portfolio that's focused on that. Um, and originally, so again, this is nine years ago, and we said, all right, well, look, I'm based in Boston. Um, and although we're, we're you know, in country a lot, we want to actually find and support local fund managers um, who either we get deal flow from or we co-invest alongside of uh, for, for, for in, in this market, in this ecosystem. And nine years ago, there were not a lot of local fintech VCs in Nigeria, Kenya, you know, in the market, Ghana, in the markets where we, where we wanted to invest. There just weren't. Like we, I, I looked back at our strategy deck from 2014 and we had, you know, 10% of this $50 million evergreen fund was going to go into local seed stage managers. And they're like, just we're not that many. So we were like, okay, well, I guess we'll go earlier. We'll do seed. Anyway, so we've built that investment portfolio. We've had some exits. We've, you know, gained experience and we've, we're active investors in that market. But then over the years, as we started to see um, more local VC talents begin to raise funds, we thought, okay, well, one thing we could do is, I mean, everybody knows, like, the, the hardest thing in the world to do is to raise your first fund. Um, if you've got no track record and you're also in a very nascent market, yeah. in a market where VC capital already is new and then you're new to it and there are no exits. I mean, it's just a nightmare. So we warehouse deals for first time fund managers, but that's risk upon risk upon risk upon risk. <laughs> and so we we think this is wildly important and for, for downstage, like sort of... For, for a market rate portfolio, but at the moment that risk is not market rate. Mm -hmm. So we use philanthropic capital at Blue Haven, or at least that's in our, it's in our philanthropic budget, the warehousing of those deals. The terms are not necessarily philanthropic, but the risk to us is. And so um, that's an example of, you know, we really want there to be more, better, local players that we can play with in this space we care a lot about in our market rate portfolio. Um, but we wouldn't take that risk necessarily if we had to you know, make market rate returns to our investors. Nobody would do that. Yeah. But so we'd use our philanthropic portfolio. If we lose it, it's okay. Yep. It's been budgeted that way. Um, and if we don't, gravy. We've got more to give to the next fund manager. And so that's an example of kind of how we saw a gap inspired by the world we want to see in our market rate portfolio, but then we were allowed to help to fill it because we budgeted for it in our philanthropic portfolio. And so it was a great also, just internally, a really fun team exercise between our investment team and our catalytic capital team. Um, and, and so that was, that was kind of a fun to see. Amazing, yeah. I appreciate you sharing a lot of those real life scenarios. Um, I think one of the things that I took away from what you just said is, don't let perfection be the enemy of progress. You started in 2014, investing in Sub-Saharan Africa when there was nothing there. Um, now that ecosystem has grown, you're probably in a better position now to pick out who are gonna be some of the players that would actually help you know, provide conviction around the strategy that you're doing. Uh, but you started somewhere and you didn't allow that perfect world to first exist before you actually went there uh, to try out. Well, and also one of the things that I think is, is important about this is, again, the mindset is actually coming from our sort of market rate investment side. So I don't just want to support any seed stage manager, they've got to win because we're trying to prove that this market works. I don't want to stand up fund managers that are going to fail. Of course that's going to happen. But 
we're really, we're, we're coming at this kind of from a market standpoint, not from like, oh, let's just do a nice thing for people. Like we're coming at this because we want to see the sector succeed and we need lots of proof points in order for that to happen. And so I think that's also an important piece of it is, is it, it, we, we, it's very targeted based on a distinct need from our market rate portfolio. Thank you. Um, Daniel, I'd love you to answer that similar question in terms of describing the role of catalytic capital to you, especially in the Latin America region and your focus on more social entrepreneurship and social thematic areas. What are some examples of maybe fun stories or even challenging times that you faced uh, that would be helpful for the audience to gain perspective of how things actually work on that side of the world? Sure. Yeah, well, I think that the market development in, in LATAM is a little different at the moment that, of course, at uh, the States. Uh, but it has been very interesting, for example, the topic that uh, we have been working in the last years, that is the workforce development, right? Uh, just as a sector, too, to give one of the examples. First, we, uh, as the foundation, first, we understand the, the philanthropic capital and the catalytic capital as, as three categories. One, it has to be long-term vision, right? We, we as a foundation have the long-term vision. We have to be there for the long term. Second, it has to be much more flexible. And third, it has to build capacities. Because when we're talking like in, in LATAM or in Colombia, of course, there is a lot of capacity building have to be set up for intermediaries, for investors, for, for the family offices, and for the foundation itself. So it has to be like a much more complementary approach. And, and on workforce development, what we're trying to do is say, OK, it's, it's a huge problem. When we're talking about youth here in, 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 in the States, we're talking about opportunity youth. And there are more than 400 million opportunity youth that has to be included into the system. And, and, and to our, in order to address that, we say, OK, which tools are there? So we start seeing, is, is there any ed tech funds? Are there any work tech, like new initiatives? And 10 years ago, there were not that many at the region. So we start saying, OK, what, what could we do to promote different type of incentives? And we saw that there was the opportunity to start using results-based finance mechanisms at the region to try to promote, bring the different stakeholders, the public sector, the investors, and the service providers, try to align incentives. And, and in order to do that, we have been building I don't know, knowledge and practices. It has been a quite challenging journey. But over the, the, the last six years, seven years, I would say Colombia has been one, and, and Latin, one of the regions that has tested the more these social impact bonds mechanisms. Yesterday, I was in a panel where you were discussing about income share agreements here at the States, how they have worked or not, yep. and the challenges. So, so I think that for us, it, it's always trying to, to change the system approach, try to understand the, the mindset. And, and, and the example was, of, of course, and the, the, the challenge is huge, but we start taking risk to make the first SIP. So Colombia had made this first social impact bond in an emerging country. It was 700 people. It was less than $1 million deal. But because of that and taking the, the risk with the IDB and also the Swiss cooperation, now today we have launched four SIPs, one outcome fund, and actually uh, the Colombia municipality has launched one of the largest results-based finance programs. Hmm. So it's trying to build evidence, trying to take those risks, and trying to think that we're actually building capacity into the long term. Many of the service providers that were on those programs are not much more uh, investable for different type of investors to actually now get into different scale of the problem. So it's trying different mechanisms. I, I think what we have tried to do is, is take different stakeholders and, and give the philanthropic uh, capital to, to make risk changes. So we were the first investor with other two foundations, and currently there are more than 15 investors promoting 6% of the impact investing market in Colombia is results-based finance uh, mechanism. So it's, it's trying to make this type of bets in order to, to invite others and trying to see this systemic change into the long term. Fantastic. So system level changes and collaboration right. has really driven a lot of your thesis and, and, and fundamentals okay. uh, from that region. Thank you. Um, Belinda. Going to move to you, right? Same question around the role of catalytic capital, but for you, what is the catalytic role that philanthropy has played when it comes to nature-based solutions in particular? And what does it actually mean to de-risk an investment? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so Deborah Schwartz was speaking on a panel a couple of days ago, and she said she defined catalytic capital as being flexible, 
risk-taking, and patient. And I think those three are really critical, and I've heard them from both of you, um, re really cr critical pieces, but not everybody can be all three. And so I think there is an importance of collaboration in many instances, and I have so much admiration for what Blue Haven is doing, where you're actually looking at the whole range of you know, high risk to market returns, and how can you get one from one to the other. Um, a lot of philanthropies don't have that luxury, but they do definitely have a role to play. What we saw in nature-based solutions, um, you know, 10 years ago, a very nascent um, early stage emerging, um, a lot of emerging funds coming, uh, coming into play. When I was at Packard Foundation, they were coming to us for investments. We saw them as very high risk. We were always interested if there was a way to de-risk our capital, and we were quite fine taking a, um, a lower return on, on our investment. Um, but the challenge was the risk, and a lot of the risk is the unknown. And, and as Liesl was saying, there's a lot of first-time fund managers, there's a lot of new business models, and there's no way to assess the track record of these investors. And so how do we deal with that? And we dealt with it in, in a number of ways. One was um, where we felt they, they were at too early a stage for anything. There's grant capital available for, for strengthening their capacity, capacity for um, professionalizing the fund manager, for um, trying to improve pipeline. Because to be honest, even for these funds, um, the pipeline is very nascent as well. And so grant capital provides a really important uh, role um, at that level. Um, first loss capital is also a, a really critical tool. Um, that, that is more difficult from a, a philanthropic perspective for a lot of folks. It, it can be part of a grant making toolbox, um, but there's a lot of separation between grants and program related investments. Um, so again, that's where I feel like collaboration comes in, where they are the more venture-focused philanthropies are willing to take that role, willing to take more risk, or as Lisa was saying, with a certain portion of, of, of their investments, they're willing to do that. Um, we found that, that in many cases, the perceived risk mm -hmm. is greater than the actual risk. And so that first loss capital, if you can dig into the, you know what the real risk is yourself and take that role, um, it's perhaps not as risky as, as is per the perception. Um, so as I mentioned, we did a lot of grant making to professionalize funds. Some of them ended up um, going, getting to a first close. Others ended up going a different route. But what was really helpful was the investment in them developing their business model. Um, on the other side, the program-related investment is, is really important where you can provide a concessional return, you can reduce the cost of capital, and you can enable, um, you can enable um, interesting innovation in terms of conservation outcomes. So for, I'll give you one example. Um, we looked at a sustainable forestry fund that was um, commercial. Um, could have been commercial was attracting already attracting institutional capital, but they wanted to go one step beyond and put do high conservation area set asides and um, increase the amount of carbon in the forest through different pruning activities, which was additional costs. The institutional investors were very nervous with these additional activities because of the potential risk and the additional costs that would have an impact on their return. Um, so we were able to structure an investment whereby if certain activities were achieved, the returns to um, the impact tranche were lower, um, which, which ensured that the institutional investors were getting their returns. If those activities weren't done, then the returns were para pursue with the institutional uh, investors. So I think there's a lot of creativity um, that can be... Um, um, looked at within um, with philanthropic capital and um, when, whether you're investing or grant making. Phenomenal. I'm going to stay with you for a little bit, Belinda, here, um, because this idea that philanthropists come in early, take that early risk, get things investment ready, and then subsidize the opportunity for private investors to come in later and then sort of make money off of it. Like, how do you 
wrap your head around that, you know, for the audience and for people who are thinking about it in that way? Why is it very important for philanthropists to think about it not in that way, but more in the way of using the tools like grants and project financing to get opportunities investment ready so that they get to the point where they can actually scale in the future? So if you could give some real examples around that, that would be really helpful as well. I think one of the challenges is we don't have enough data to really know whether or not we're providing a subsidy, right? I mean, if we had full information, we'd be able to say, well, we can take a first loss risk at this percent, and it'll definitely, it definitely won't be providing a subsidy to the private sector. So we have to guess a little bit. Um, but in sectors like nature-based solutions, where you have, on one side of the economy, you have, um, you know, billions of dollars being driven towards the destruction of subsidy dollars coming from government and 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 therefore you know um, leveraging uh, in commercial investors into the space and you have a lot of destruction of nature i would argue that we have to be on the other side we ha we have to subsidize um the um um you know positive um reversal of of that trend so that's that's one one issue. Having said that, I think it is important to to really be able to look at what is what is a subsidy and and what isn't. In these in these very nascent sectors, I think we're doing a lot of trial and error. Um, you're not seeing private investors go into these investments without a first loss tranche. And so what we need to do is go in there, experiment. I think in the same way that Lisa was talking about, um, make these investments look at the outcomes, and perhaps it's just a proof of concept um, that, that needs to happen. Um, but I think we need to really dig deeper on, on that idea that we're subsidizing the private sector and really understand, you know, the private sector isn't looking necessarily for impact right now. And if we want impact, we're going to have to drive capital in that direction. Thank you. Um, Daniel, I, I want to hear your perspective from LATAM, just given the sort of slowdown in funding in the region in general, and more broadly, you know, from a global system perspective, how do you use innovative ways to change the narrative around sort of this question of first loss coming in and, and using philanthropy as that tool to be able to kickstart a lot of that conversation as well? Okay, well, I think it has changed in the region over the last three years. One of the reasons is because the conversation started to have much more within the continuum of capital, mainly because Latin Pacto, the Venture Philanthropy Network started, and that gave us the possibility to have a different type of understanding the roles, right? Understanding the different type of funding pockets and understanding how are we actually necessary, the philanthropic resources, where is the, the risk and where could be first loss, and in which spaces we are just trying to, to have a different type of narrative, exactly trying to understand where the opportunities are. We have the, the event of, of Latin Pacto this year in, in, in Rio, and it was very interesting to understand. We're not talking only about bringing philanthropic as first loss, but actually, as you were mentioning, to test different models, to, to try different mechanisms, to actually give the first opportunity to family offices or corporates to understand all the tools that are available within the market to actually move after the first testing. So we are the MVP stage. So, so we are able to actually promote, see what's happening, how to actually then scale it. And then the, the, the private sector come. But second is having on the same table the conversation of, for example, in our case, uh, the, the, the family that runs the company Corona, they, even though they are promoting sustainability, they are not impact driven but they understand that the foundation and the family office could see our role to start changing the conversation in the, in the next gens. So it's first generation, and they understand this as a way to include new conversation that could be potentially include all the family and the company size. So, so it's, it's not only about the risking, and, and, and also we're trying to be a bridge with the international cooperation or the DFIs within the region, because they're changing totally the mindset. We were used to get all the grant resources, flexible funding, and they start saying the USA, the Swiss cooperation, Canadian cooperation, who are changing this. If you want to continue with the receiving resources of cooperation for development of the country, you have to start seeing different ways in how you, there are innovative tools, 
Impact Link Finance or many others to actually start working together with them to promote the development. So we're the bridge in order to actually get those conversations going and, and, and understand that. And last but not least, I, I think the foundations or the philanthropic has also the role to, to, to get the local sense, right? What, what's happening at the territory level, what's happening at, at the participants level. Uh, I know there have been a lot of DI discussions within the conversation the last two days, but, but the foundation have also this, this task or to actually combine the, the, the two conversations together. Thank you. I, I particularly like what you said about the continuum of capital, right? There's always a start, but there's always that continuum of who joins after um, once that kick starts the idea and, and gets it moving. So, so Lisa, I'm, I'm going to move over to you because you take a very whole portfolio approach, right? So you do see that from start to a little bit to the end, right? Taking, looking at philanthropic capital all the way to market rate and seeing how one side could inform the other and how best to um, efficiently utilize that entire channel in itself. So if you could speak a little bit into what are some things that are market rate and what are some things that investors are just not willing to pay market rate for? I mean, I think it's a good, it's a, it's a good question because, you know, I think this term market rate gets, gets used sort of liberally and, and, and not necessarily very like, uh, you know, um, um, if, and, I think it's what what is a reasonable return for the thing you're trying to do. So if you're trying to, you know, invest in an early childhood development intervention, like maybe 18, 20 years should be market rate to see the payoff of that investment. Like it's unreasonable to think that you would see a return on that investment any sooner in terms of productivity or, you know, qualies or dollies or like whatever, whatever outcome you're going to base it off of. Mm -hmm. But we don't do that, right? Markets are terrible at investing systemically in early childhood development because we've decided that, you know, it needs to be a five to 10 year return horizon. It doesn't make any sense. So what we try to do again and again in the luxurious position of being a single family office um, that doesn't have to, you know, we're an absolute return vehicle at the end of the day, um, and we've got a very long time horizon. Um, we we try to be more realistic around what what is an, what is what is an actual reasonable market rate for that investment, and and benchmarking it against that. So one of the things with our catalytic investments and our philanthropic event investments, we don't benchmark against. Um, so, like, if I was looking at uh, a concessionary investment in, say, an emerging market private debt vehicle, um, if it's coming from our philanthropic portfolio or our catalytic portfolio, I'm not going to benchmark it against a market rate private debt investment in that market. I'm going to benchmark it against a grant. So, is this, if I spent you know, a million dollars in grant funding to achieve that outcome is, is this investment higher leverage than what that grant would do? And so I think when you move the benchmark, it's like way above market rate, right? Because it would have been 100% loss. Now it's maybe 80% loss or 1% return. Mm -hmm. Holy smokes, like that's insane. <laughs> Nobody's getting that in their VC portfolio. Right. So you've got to move the benchmark to what the appropriate thing is for the impact that you're trying to have. And then the world sort of starts to open up. And, um, and so I think, but again, we can't do that with all of our portfolio, but with the precious sort of grant and catalytic piece and looking at how that assists our investment portfolio. Um, I think another thing as well as like who plays where on the capital stack and is it okay for philanthropy to de-risk private investors, um, I, I think things get so fuzzy around who's de-risking what for whom. So, you know, you know, can a biotech VC say that they didn't take massive subsidy from NIH grants to develop drugs that, yeah, they, okay, you did it. You came <laughs> in at phase three. Like, you know, there was a lot of philanthropy, probably, you know, university funding, all the kind of stuff that, that has led up to that point. But then at the same time, 
If I hear another development finance institution sit on a panel and say they are de-risking investments for private investors, and I'm like, we came in four rounds before you. <laughs> we're a family office. Like, we're de-risking it for you. You weighed, you stayed on the sidelines and waited until it was like a profitable company, and then you came in. You know, it's like you're taxpayer-funded private equity. Yep, yep. Okay, fine, but just don't tell me you're de-risking it for us. So I think it, I think it just depends. Like I see it on both sides, and I, I don't know. I don't get too fussy about it because at the end of the day, if it's doing the thing we want it to do, and if the person downstream has more money, then can scale it, then they sort of have the right to to to, to it. So I think I don't know. I don't get too fussy about where we sit. And am I, you know, am I subsidizing somebody else's return? I don't know. No, fantastic. Thank you. That that example was great in just providing illustration around how best to think about it. And a lot of it is dynamic in nature, right? Yeah. So you can't really think of it as, you know, monolithic in in in, in one view. Um, so it's helpful to you know unpack a little bit of how you're thinking about it using using the tools that you have. Um, I want to flip now to more of a just a broader question. And this will be the last question before we, we take more questions from, from the audience. And I'll start with you, Liesl. So if you were to accomplish only one thing with your philanthropy that would become your legacy, what would that be? Oh my goodness. Um, uh, so one thing that we are trying to get better at at Blue Haven, like I'm excited about our impact investing portfolio, that's moving and grooving. Like, I love the stuff we're invested in and constantly finding new deals across asset classes. And, you know, that's fun. I'm, I love our catalytic capital portfolio. And um, we're also uh, really trying to help build the catalytic capital ecosystem as well. We're, we're working um, closely with a new fund called TrimTab um, that is essentially a catalytic capital investment vehicle to try to find lots of catalytic deals around the world and build that as an asset class. Um, so excited about that and excited about our philanthropy, as I've described, that, that, that sort of tries to fill in the gaps, sort of like the liquid of our portfolio. Um, but where the, the piece that we kind of have been doing but I want to get better at is how this plays into our sort of civic engagement and policy work. Mm -hmm. So... You know, things like we like investing in, you know, small businesses and underserved communities in the U.S. and building wealth, you know, in, in, uh, through CDFIs and things like that. And in addition to that, how does that then inform our electoral strategy? You know, like in 2020, for example, um, uh, and in, in the wake of Black Lives Matter and looking through like all of our investments and how does that, like what are we doing investment wise? And then we also then focus like all of our kind of campaign money around local attorneys general races mm -hmm. in states that have, you know, very high incarcerated populations and what's happening there. And so like trying to get very specific around how issues we see in the world and our own investment portfolio, it's not just normal philanthropy, but it's political and it's electoral and it's civic engagement and it's youth voter turnout and it's democracy building. And how does that underpin all of these other things that we're doing as well? And so that's one area um, that, I mean, my husband Ian's been working on for many years and we're finally starting to like see these two things come together in our own portfolio and lean into that. Because again, in this incredibly luxurious position of being a single family office and we're not a large foundation that will get in trouble if we get political. And so like, okay, we'll do it. Like, yeah, let's get into it. Um, and so that's, I think, in terms of legacy, I want to get, I'm excited that we're using the financial capital stack from philanthropy to market rate investing, but we need to get smarter around layering in the kind of, civic engagement piece to that. And we're not quite, 
<laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Love it. But we're not we're we're not quite there yet. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where I want to go. So ask me about it again in a couple of years and see if we get there. Yeah. I really appreciate that. And maybe I just ask a question, you know, off the back of that. What do you view right now as one of the biggest hurdles or multiple hurdles that you need to get over to, to get there holistically? Because there's a lot of challenges when you start to mix, you know, political, oh. democracy, civic. Uh, yeah, a I lot mean, of touch points. Uh, here's one. Like, I'll tell you, if you want to get kicked out of, like, a family office cocktail party, like, real quick, um, <laughs> bring out, bring up, a, like, a wealth tax or, like, closing the capital gains loophole. Like, wow. You know, so, like, everyone's like, yes, I'll do impact investing. And, yes, I'll do philanthropy and I'll give all my money away. And then you're like, how about a wealth tax? And they're like, absolutely not. Get out of here. <laughs> But tax reform? Are you kidding me? Like, we want to do one thing that will, like, actually genuine participatory grant making. Pay your taxes. Mm -hmm. Like, just pay your damn tax. Anyway. Um, so, like, that would be one thing. But it's uncomfortable. Like, it's a very, it's an odd, it seems so simple. But then everyone's like, oh, well, it won't happen. So let me do this, like, wildly complicated blended finance thing. Mm -hmm. Like, what if we just did that? But that is harder. Sometimes the simple thing where you give up power and you have to, you know, like, it's uncomfortable. So, like, those, I guess that's, that's one area that, that I think we could really focus on. And it would end a lot of these conversations. And yeah. we would have less work to do if yeah. we all just kind of paid our taxes. Yep. Um, <laughs> I Sorry. No, I appreciate that, that context a lot. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, do you get kicked out a lot of these uh, family Yeah, they don't care for that. Like, that's one. It, 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 I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm in a friendlier room here at SOCAP. But yeah, like traditional family office conferences, they're like, not that bitch. Like, we know that you guys are proponents of that. But that might be alienating for the people in the room. It's fine. Fair enough. But like, I just, um, you know, those are the kinds of things where, if I'm really putting my money where my mouth is, that, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so I, I, anyway, and we can complain about how government uses it and all of that. So get involved. If you don't like, you know, how government's spending your money, go run for office, like do a thing. And so I think those are, uh, but, but that would be like deep systemic change. Yeah. And so I guess very broadly speaking is that I really want to see more, in, more connection between our sort of like political civic engagement minds and 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 our investing and if you know if you're talking about systems change impact investing and you're not getting political you're leaving out a massive layer of potential change thank you um, daniel i'd love to hear your thoughts on the one thing with your philanthropy that would become your legacy um, if you could think about one thing. I know there's probably multiple things you could think about. Oh, now, now I got confused. I got inspired. <laughs> <laughs> but you're doing a lot of that civic, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You I've do been that. working, yeah. Yeah, well, on the foundation of the fourth generation of the family. And of course, we understand that the main two areas is, is always building public goods. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the conversation, it's building something that is actually open for everyone to replicate, to use it. To, to actually get inspired of, of, of what the foundation is doing, uh, not only within Colombia, but also regional-wise. Uh, but now that the last years we have been also working, trying to work with, with trying to unlock our balance sheet in, in a different way, be, be, because resources, uh, are, the, the scarcity mindset, you know, on resources of, for social issues is, is, is a huge topic for, for, for Colombia and for the region because of inequalities. And efficiency, effectiveness is one of the two topics, I think, that how to use those resources. Because even though in Colombia, if, if we pay better and more taxes that we're now starting to do because of current government, the issue is how, how you use those resources. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so even though if it's at the public sector, it's at the private sector, how to actually be transparent about how, what, what is working and how to continue doing what's working is something and, and not and having into the long term. And in order to do that, saying, of course, the, the innovative finance and, and the civic part, I think 
place-based investment is something that as a legacy we have to start changing mm. because the context is very, very different from city to city or region to region in, in, in many places, but mostly in countries such as Colombia, where you have many countries, where you have many realities, where most of the inequality changes. So what we're trying to do and to build into the future as, as a legacy is, is to understand in, in a much more bottom-up, top-down, but regional planning or territory planning, place-based investments in order to collect all, all the potential stakeholders, public, private sector, you know, in finance, but trying to see in the long-term view of what we could do. So the foundation has prioritized, because of the pandemic, five territories with totally different contexts within Colombia to start making a bet how we could have a systemic try to approach into the long term and see what do we learn and make it a public good to actually start replicating in different territories of Colombia and others. Now we're working with different partnerships globally, of course, and, 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 and the similarities that we have from Barranquilla to Mombasa are incredible. Mm. But we're not sharing what's happening with those two different territories, but, but, but we could be closer, but having also the local lens at the territory level. So I think one of the legacies uh, should be this place-based long-term type of investment and bringing the different tools, but also making a public good to actually inspire and share with others. Thank you. I, I want to double click very quickly into something you mentioned, but maybe some examples of what are some of the very underlying systemic social issues that you know, folks face in, in Colombia, right? Like, you know, I don't think everybody here in the room gets that perspective on a daily. So it'd be really good to shed some light on you know, some of the very tangible things that you think about. On systemic issues, like sector topics or? Thematic areas, um, it could be sector, any example? Well, well, m most of our barriers, we have a lot of issues, of course, on, on poverty, but, but if you go back into poverty, the education issues in Colombia are terrible, but most of it, it comes back <laughs> once again to corruption and trust. And, 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 the, and the, main, the main barrier within building anything within Colombia is trust and how to actually, you, you can overpass transparency, corruption, and that uh, uh, as, a, as a basic opportunity to then overpass investing in the basic needs and nutrition, education, and others. But I think the trust, mistrust, is, is one of the systemic challenges within Colombia and I think within most of the regions. But, but I think building there comes from collective leadership and trying to build in, in, in the different stakeholders uh, as a basic barrier for competitiveness and, and other development issues. But, but it depends if the cities where, where you see Colombia has been growing a lot on, on the last 10 years, but over the last five years, we have been struggling in how to continue our development in, in, at the different territory level. Thank you. Very, very, very helpful. Thank you. Linda, same question for you. Okay, so I just want to be totally clear. It's not my philanthropic money. <laughs> <laughs> we are aggregating others' philanthropic capital along with public and private capital. But I want to reiterate what I said at the beginning is that philanthropic capital plays an outsized role in mobilizing public and private capital um, to, to impact. And I also wanted to pick up on a point that Liesl made about DFIs because whew, that's <laughs> one of our biggest... Um, you know, criticisms of DFIs is that they actually aren't taking the risk yeah. that they say they are. Mm -hmm. And then they're, they're looking for returns that are sometimes on a par or greater than um, what we see is, is really realistic, um, particularly from emerging markets. Um, so from our perspective, I think, I think what I would love to see is phil philanthropic capital, and I would love to see this with the initiative that we did, the Catalytic Capital Initiative, which is quite similar to Trim Hub, um, is that we can take that small amount of philanthropic capital, use it, and, and we have these complicated blended structures <laughs> that I wish were much simpler, but they're important as well for reducing risk, but use that to leverage the private sector, the, pub the public sector, the public capital, that's not going into um, these blended investments right now. And we would say, like, I think there's something like 2% of ODA capital, ODA funding actually goes towards blended finance. Mm. And we need to see more of that. Mm. We need to see ODA capital coming in. It's not a subsidy. Maybe it is a subsidy, but it's a necessary subsidy 
to achieve true impact. Um, so if we have a small dent in that 2% and can increase it to 5%, particularly for nature-based solutions, I think we will have an outsized impact on mobilizing private capital in, into, um, for our purposes, nature-based solutions, but I think more broadly for impact. Thank you. Um, I wanna, thank you. I got the little 10 minute mark here. So it's perfect because now I want to, really go into some of the questions that you all have submitted on here. I think we've had a really engaging and enlightening session where we're hearing actual real life examples and illustrations of how to think about these things. And so some of these questions that are here actually goes a little deeper into some of the questions I would ask too, uh, to dig in. So, so Liso, I think this one's particularly for you around uh, civic engagement. So can you define what civic engagement means as a tool for long-term impact? Sure. Um so one example of this uh, uh, is actually comes out of um, a, a re realization I made. We were, we were I was asked to present to a group of family offices around Blue Haven's um, climate portfolio, and so we, you know, everything from our, you know, private equity and debt, venture capital, catalytic capital, philanthropy related to climate across Blue Haven's portfolio. And this was a couple years ago. And I think outstanding at that point, there was like 112 million or something across. And that's not counting public markets, but just private markets related to climate. And so we were listing this out and talking about, you know, the interplay between these different organizations and, you know, some of it is research and some of it is infrastructure and some of it is innovation and deployment. And, and then someone asked me, so across all those investments, what, which one has had the biggest like ROI from a climate perspective in Blue Haven's portfolio? And I looked at it and I was like, damn, it's not on here. Mm -hmm. It's our youth voter engagement work that we've been doing for 10 years to get young people to vote in midterm elections um, that has meaningfully given a mandate to this Congress to pass the IRA. And like specifically, like Speaker Pelosi called my husband and said we would not have passed the IRA but for the campus turnout strategy that the organizations that he started has started to, to move and mobilize. And it was a very clear mandate that if they wanna keep young people voting consistently, they, needed, they need to move on climate. And so the thing is, I mean, is the IRA perfect? Of course not. Is it a massive thing for the US and a huge sort of investment and endorsement in our, in, in our climate strategy? Absolutely. And so the thing is, is that I don't know if that's just, you know, Pelosi saying to a donor, thanks. <laughs> but we do know that that work absolutely systemically changed voter turnout for a population that doesn't usually show up. Mm -hmm. And so that connection to all of the work and how it underpins um, anyone's work in climate, not just our own portfolio, but certainly in the US, is absolutely moved and mobilized by what that what that legislation did. And so that's the piece where it's like, you've got, that's the civic engagement strategy that just catapults any investment strategy that we have in that case in the climate space, but really generally speaking. So that's one example of where our civics portfolio really was the trampoline mm -hmm. <laughs> for where, what our future climate portfolio is gonna look like. That's, that's very insightful. Um, Belinda, I think this question may be for you, but Daniel and, and, and Lisa, will feel free to jump in as well. How are you working to ensure you help companies and ventures develop the blended finance models and ensure that there's access to different risk tranches in ensuring they have access to the continuum of, of financing? So I think that question well, we're talking about the continuum of financing. We're talking about companies at different stages. Um, we are looking at so one of the one of the biggest gaps we've identified is that early stage project or enterprise um, capital um, that is, you know, considered high risk, but perhaps also there's a lot of perceived risk. And so that's one area that that we're focusing on is getting that very early stage capital um, to to those entities. 
And then on the on the continuum, it's it's that you know initially it could be um, the seed capital. Um, in, in our case, we're we're looking a lot at investing in funds. So where we're looking, the funds are investing in the corporations, but providing that initial seed capital to enable them to go out and start investing, get track record, um, and and show proof of concept is getting through that you know kind of initial J part of the J curve, and then moving on. In in some instances, it's it's really just um, being a first mover, being a first investor, and 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 showcasing that there is opportunity in, in these areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the, the blended structures, I mean, I think that that's an, an, a role where, you know, we're looking at a lot of, a lot of these funds that have blend, blended fund structures and what is the most important role that we can play in, in taking a first loss position or is it just um, taking an anchor position um, that'll crowd in other investors into the into this, um, space? Thank you. Um, Daniel, I will give you an opportunity to also answer that question, but just to layer on another question, and I'm going to paraphrase this question. Do you work with banks? And if you do or do not, any reasons why you choose or choose not to, especially a lot of them who are interested in using blend and finance to de-risk before they come in, what is their involvement and how should you think about their involvement? Okay. Well, currently, most of our programs, we work with the bank foundations, <laughs> not the banks directly, but there are many, many of them working very, very closely with the also resources and knowledge from the bank trying to bring all the innovation. Uh, but now we're currently trying to develop one, one program that is also an early stage. We have like a pool fund of resources within five of the largest foundations in Colombia and also with the support of the Ford Foundation. And, and, and what we're trying to do is to give much more flexible funding. But th there could apply from NGOs to social enterprises and give them or, or grants or flexible lending. But when we're trying to see into the next stages, uh, uh, cohorts probably, they will actually need a bank lending as our partner and will be probably the guarantee in some of the cases to actually make sure it continues the funding depending on the stage of the company. So I, we're currently not, uh, true to the direct question of working with banks, but the foundation of the banks are very, very getting closer uh, to understand how to actually link where the opportunities are, where could be first loss, guarantees, or play different roles, and actually get into the market. Because I think in our countries, there is the, I don't know, there are, there are not the connections on the, on, the market, on the market and the banks of the social service supplier. Right, so I, I think there is a lot of opportunities to actually get to the scale where we're demanded, if they're better in performance management and internal capacity, in order to get into different type of bank funding. So I would say that. Thank you. 